As we move into our message tonight, if we haven't had the chance to meet, I'm Robbie Itterberg. I'm one of the pastors. And we are continuing. This is our second week uh, in a new series called Unstuck that's going to take us right up to Easter. And we're calling it Unstuck because the reality is when we all step back and we look at our lives, we all are or will be stuck in some way but we don't want to stay there. We don't want to stay stuck. In, in fact, we believe that Jesus wants to get us unstuck from all the patterns of thinking, the behaviors, the interactions relationally, the way we approach God, all those things that leave us spinning our wheels. And so in this series, we want to see if we can bring together in our emotionality and our spirituality. That's what we talked about last week, that so many of us are stuck, even as followers of Jesus, because we live a life and a relationship with God that's disconnected from our emotionality. The outward stuff that we do for God doesn't always touch the inward life of the depths of our heart and soul. And so we want to open ourselves to the best that we can to bring those together, to integrate those, to see what Jesus is going to do as he's going to get us unstuck. And so if you want, you can listen to last week's message, particularly on our YouTube channel, PCDRNJ, or on our podcast. And if you haven't gotten a, a book yet that's also a part of this journey, where there's a book that we sold out last week, we got some more in, it's in the Welcome Center, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, you can get that. Join a group, it's really a powerful and beautiful experience to be a part of a group. If you don't know how, you can also connect through the Welcome Center, I'd love to talk to you but would love to help make that happen because we believe God is going to do something new in us and move us forward, get us unstuck in these weeks together. So as we move into tonight's message, I had a, a really good friend in college named Bobby, and Bobby was hilarious, and every time we would go out to a restaurant, and he would put down his credit card or his debit card, he would sign with a fake name. And so, like, he would, one of his favorites, he'd sign Garfield, it just regularly, and he, he would sign Bill Cosby, and, you know, he, he would sign, it was never a problem, and he knew that, because I guess they, the credit cards only have a problem if you call and say, I didn't make that charge, and then they look and they see Garfield was eating at, you know, Red Robin or whatever, <laughs> but... Uh, but he'd usually, he'd used all of these celebrity names, so he, Michael Jordan was one of his favorites and so many others. And as I was thinking about this week, this week, and I was thinking about the Super Bowl that just happened, apparently celebrities do the same thing, but kind of in reverse. Like we usually choose fake names that would be celebrities, or at least Bobby did, but they choose other names, like when they're going to go stay in a hotel. And apparently someone leaked a whole bunch of these that they had discovered. You know, so like Kim Kardashian often uses Princess Jasmine, or at least she did before it got leaked. Tom Hanks w was Johnny, Johnny Madrid, I guess. And uh, Beyonce was Ingrid Jackson. And, and George Clooney liked to go really undercover, so he was Arnold Schwarzenegger. I don't, I don't know how that exactly worked out for him. Maybe it was just aspirational and he just, you know, wanted big muscles. But, you know, and it's, it's fun, right? It's fun to pretend. It was fun for, for Bobby. It's fun. It's fun to stay incognito, right? It's part of what mask, you know, those masquerade parties had once been about. And, and it is fun until it stays with us. Right? Because one of the ways we get stuck is when we put on this mask, this false identity, and we don't take it off. And we are not able to be the true self that God has made us to be. And so we're going to jump into this idea tonight through Luke chapter 3 and into 4, as we're going to look at this story from Jesus' life. If you'd like, you can follow along on the screen with me, but let's hear God's word for us this evening. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And he was praying, and as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Jesus full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. 
The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. And let's pray as we move into this together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time and this space. And we invite you to move within it, that you would have your way. Holy Spirit, that you would lead our thinking, that you would move within us, that we can respond or give us courage. Give us that that bravery to embrace the fullness of our true self as you made us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So one issue that has been heavily debated throughout the course of history is how much Jesus really understood about who he was. How much did he understand about his identity? Did he know that he was God? Did he not know that he was God? You know, he did, what's, what was that like? And actually, the question is you know, a very interesting question, and it's, but it's not directly answered in the scripture. We have to infer different things from Jesus' life to, to get a sense of what his own self-understanding was. Well, one of these moments we get a glimpse in Luke chapter 2, Jesus was 12 years old. And his family had gone up to Jerusalem for a pilgrimage, and they went into the temple. And after the days of celebration ended, his family, which is not just like you know, Mary and Joseph, it's like the extended family, it's like all of the cousins and the aunts and the uncles and the neighbors, I mean, it was the whole family, all got into this giant caravan and they were headed back home. And over the course of a couple of days, Mary and Joseph start to realize, wait, Jesus isn't with us. And so they go back to look for him and find him eventually in the temple. And Jesus basically says, why are you freaking out? My paraphrase. Like, why are you freaking out? Didn't you know I needed to be about my father's business? So we get this moment where he understands that God is his father in a unique way because nobody really talked about God like that. And so he was already embracing this kind of unique identity even at that moment. And then here we fast forward a little bit into Luke chapter 3, where we began our reading today. And people are headed out to the Jordan River, just outside Jerusalem, a little ways where they could walk. And, and John the baptizer was baptizing people, you know, calling them to repentance, back to a faithfulness to God. And Jesus goes out to be baptized with the people. As he's entering into the water, he's actually, in that way, identifying with the rest of us, kind of claiming his human identity alongside of us and being baptized just like everybody else because that's the right thing to be done. And then as he's coming out and he's praying, we hear this voice that came from heaven, yes, this is my son. You are, Jesus, my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. So we get this this clarity for Jesus in this moment, if nothing else before that, right? Jesus clearly understands his humanity as he's going to be baptized. He understands and hears directly from the Father, you're my son uniquely, like, you know, among all the people. And then this really weird thing happens. The Holy Spirit takes Jesus out into the wilderness where he's tempted by the devil for 40 days. He's out there being tempted. For 40 days, he doesn't eat. For 40 days, the devil, we're not sure if he's right there with him or if he's just talking in his head because it doesn't really tell us, but it's tempting him. 
And, and the question is tempting him to what? And we can see clearly there are three different temptations, right? He says, hey, do this. And Jesus is like, yeah, no. And we'll get into that a little bit more. But behind this, it was more than the temptations to the particular things. He's actually tempting him to abandon the reality of his identity. He's actually tempting him to put on a false self and abandon the true self the true person, the true nature that he had and that God was leading him into. He was being tempted to put on a mask, if you will. And it happens in these three different ways, but we know it's kind of this temptation to put on a, a, a mask because it's always a distortion. The devil's always distorting the true identity, the true self of Jesus. Just look at his first temptation. He says, if you are the son of God, we can get to the details in a second, but right, he, he's bringing the question up. Well, is that really your identity? Is this really who you are? And what does that really mean? Because underlying the devil's temptation is a lot of assumptions about what it means to be the son of God who's come to earth. And so he says, if you are the son of God, maybe, doubt, possibly, then here's what you should do. You should tell this stone over here to become bread. Right? He's hungry. He, he hasn't eaten. For 40 days he hasn't eaten. And Jesus was human, is human. He did experience hunger. He did appreciate eating, which I'm glad because so do I. But this temptation is not just a temptation to eat. It's a temptation to bypass the human reality and the human experience. It's a temptation to put off his identity as the true human, true, the son of God who became flesh, who took on humanity and bypass all of the uncomfortable feelings that go along with hunger, that go along with weakness, right? And, and we all live there. And so it's to ignore and bypass the reality of what's going on within him, right? And so Jesus in this moment, he may even be a little hangry, right? I mean, some of you, I know, I know you might, may not have had dinner before you came. You might be getting a little hangry yourself, right? It's that combination of hungry and angry. And, and we say it nowadays really to justify whatever's going to happen next, right? I'm hangry, which means I can just put you on blast because I feel like it. Not, you know, it's not a, oh, I need to tend to what's going on within me, take care of myself. No, it's just justifying the reason that I've been short-tempered, I'm impatient, and really I don't want your face right now. Right? And so Jesus is tempted in this moment to bypass all of that, which is very human. It's very real. To ignore the feelings uh, within him and instead embrace power in that moment for his own benefit and his own comfort. To do something that would benefit him in a way that then alienates him from his humanity. And this isn't what God intended for him. It's not who he is at the core. And so it would, in other words, the devil's saying, why don't you just go ahead and flex and get the benefit of it for yourself. Peter Scazzaro, whose book we're reading, talks about this temptation. He talks about all these temptations, and he says this particular temptation is a temptation to, instead of have his identity connected to his humanity and God's plan as, you know, as the son of God, and instead to connect his identity to the phrase, I am what I do. Right? I am what I do what I do. And when we start thinking about the kinds of masks that we get tempted to put on, that one might start to hit a little closer to home. We might start to put on the mask of, you know what, okay, I've got to do life in a certain particular way. I've got to have these opportunities with this kind of outcome, these kinds of influences. I may, in fact, need to do in order to be okay. Oh man, and it's so easy to apply it to our religious life. Because we can, you can get really busy doing a lot of stuff for God. 
Right? You can get really busy and you can show up lots of times a week and you can do all the right things. And then we can look at those things that we do and say, see, I'm good because of what I do. Instead of realizing, you know what, that's all outward. The doing is all temporary and it is a mask for what's going on inside. Maybe I'm doing compulsively because I'm afraid of the reality that I feel inadequate everywhere I go. So I gotta do more and I gotta do more and I gotta do more to cover over that feeling. Right? And so maybe my true self is I feel a little inadequate, I feel insecure, I feel hungry, I feel vulnerable, I feel weak, but I'm going to embrace this. You know what, I can power through. I can get on to the next thing. Nothing's gonna hold me down. I'm gonna overcome every challenge. I am what I do and I'm an overcomer. And Jesus was facing the similar kind of temptation just to overcome, bypass the reality of vulnerability. And instead, of course, we know that, he says you can't live on bread alone but you need the word of God to feed you. And certainly that's reminding us that hey, that's what's gonna remind him and remind us where our true self comes from, right? The, the true self will be connected with what God says about us and what he wants for us. And so Jesus comes back to the scripture over and over again to fight these temptations. But the second temptation comes where the devil leads him to this high place. And in this one moment, shows him, he looks out and shows him all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil says to Jesus, hey, here's the deal. I'm going to give you all the authority, all the splendor, all the glory over all of these nations. They're mine. I can do with them what I want. So all you have to do is worship me and I'll give you all of it. Now, beyond the, the direct temptation to outright idolatry, right, to, not, to worship somebody other than God the Father, there's so much more here that is about Jesus' self, his identity, and what it was meaning to be the human that is the Son of God. Because what is happening here is the devil is tempting Jesus to take a shortcut, right? Because... Ultimately, Jesus is going to get the glory and the splendor. He's going to have the authority. He's going to be the king ruling over the nations of the world. It's all going to be his anyway. At the end, there's just one slight obstacle between here and there. It's a cross. And the temptation here is to once again... Ignore the feelings that are within him and seek a shortcut to overcome. To ignore the reality of his fear. To ignore the fact that Jesus had a genuine desire not to go to the cross. Did you know that? Did you ever think about that? That Jesus didn't want to do that. Like that was not the high priority for him. To go and brutally suffer. We see that, we know that, because the night before he knew he was going to go dry, die on that cross, he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane and he pleads with God. Father, if there is any other way, let's do that. If there's any other way that doesn't involve the suffering and the pain and the brutality and the separation, if there's any other way than the cross, let's do that. Let this cup pass from me. So he didn't want this. And the devil was saying, you don't have to have it. You can skip to the end, just ignore the fear, ignore all that stuff within you, and become the conquering ruler. Jump right to the end, bow your knee before me, and I'll let you skip all of that, because I'll just give you the kingdoms that you came to save in the first place. And Jesus is not pulled in by this temptation, of course, because he's Jesus. But the temptation in this case is what Peter Scazzaro says, I am what I have. Jesus could have just grabbed hold of the kingdoms. He could have grabbed hold of the authority. He could have grabbed hold of all of that influence. He could have had the kingdoms of the earth in that moment. 
And it's, instead, he resists the temptation. See, all of this temptation to get to the false self is about ignoring what's really going on within me. Right? Because we don't really want to acknowledge that we're weak and vulnerable. We don't want to acknowledge that we're afraid. We don't want to acknowledge that, you know what, God, I don't like your plan for my life. And yet, when we actually start peeling back and we go, honestly, that's, that's truly who I am. And the effort to put on that false self is the effort to get control, to mask over those things for us that we don't want to have to acknowledge. That perhaps you were trained, like we talked a little bit about last week, to not acknowledge them, especially the big and the bad ones, right? To not acknowledge sadness, to not acknowledge anger, to not acknowledge when you're in a place of hurt, to don't let anybody see that. But the true self says, now this is the reality. Doesn't hide from it, but instead acknowledges it. And so then the devil leads him to the third place, right? And he gets him to the highest point on the temple in the middle of Jerusalem. So you got to try to picture this scene a little bit, right? He's there and he's kind of up on the high point. We might think of like the steeple. They didn't probably have a steeple. It was mostly just the highest ledge, perhaps, and the highest roof of the temple. Looking down where on, on one side of the temple, it's sitting right along this cliff. It's like 450 feet all the way down to the bottom, and there's people milling around all the time. The temple is a busy place. There's d daily sacrifices going on. You know, there's folks, you know, exchanging money and ch working out offerings. And there's just people coming and going all the time. The temple was a center of religious, but also of commercial life. And so the devil is, stand is there at the top saying to Jesus, come on, show them who you really are. Throw yourself off of here because God's going to... God's going to, he's already promised to send his angels. You won't hit your foot. You won't even, you won't get hurt in the slightest. But man, when they see you, this is the implied part. This is the temptation. When they see you, man, then they're going to really know who you are. So if you are the son of God, really, throw yourself off. And imagine that. If you're one of the people down around the temple... And you're looking up going, what are they doing up there? And then you see this guy launch off the temple. You're first horrified, I'm sure. Can't believe what you're seeing. This is, this is awful. It's going to end badly. And then you see right before he hits 450 feet down, er, does that like hover thing over the, over the ground. Like, woo, that was a close one. I mean, what would you be thinking? I mean, everybody would have been drawn to that, right? Everybody would have been drawn like, like moths to the flame. And they would have been in awe of him. And they would have commended him and given him praise and accolades and, and applause. And in this moment, Jesus is once again tempted to a shortcut because he's going to get the praise. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2 that Eventually, after his obedience to death on a cross, he will be resurrected and then he does rise to heaven. And at the end of days, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every knee. He will receive all of the glory, all of the accolades. But he's tempted in this moment once again to the shortcut. And Scazzaro names this one, I am what others think. <laughs> Popularity. Expectations. See, the people expected a guy who was going to do these powerful miracles, a guy who would be a conquering ruler. The people had lots of expectations for who the Messiah was going to be. And so... They were constantly, even after this moment, they were trying to make him king. They were trying to fast forward to the end. They were trying to have him flex his muscle, get rid of the Romans, to push around other people, to use his power, to use his influence. All the time, Jesus is coming up against expectations. 
I mean, we live in that all the time, don't we? That perhaps is the greatest temptation to put, putting on the false self of all, is the temptation that's created through the expectation of others. And I, get, I, I understand, because we learn early what's acceptable and not acceptable, and we learn to hide the things that are less acceptable, and we bring out the things that are acceptable. We do that in our families, we do that among friendships, we do that all the time. But that's by definition, no longer living into the true self. That's putting on the mask of the false self. I'm the achiever, right? Or I'm the powerful one, or I'm, I'm, I'm the one who stays in control, or I'm the one who's creative, or I'm the one who's funny, or I'm the one, whatever it is, put your label on it. I'm the one who's knowledgeable and competent, and I'm the one who's strong. All of these things that we, we said, this is the thing that defines me. The problem is when we grab onto any of those things and we make those things the focus of ourself, we then become slaves to that. And we will start hiding the things that are contrary to that. I don't have control. In fact, I'm weak. I don't have the answers. So Jesus was being tempted constantly with this false self to be a conquering ruler, to embrace power, to use it for his own comfort, to seek the influence and popularity of the crowds, all of it to avoid taking on our sin. But that's what he was sent for. His true self was the fully human that came to just like us, to become like us, right? to come and enter into our human experience and as the son of God to also come so that we could have salvation so that we could have forgiveness, so that we could have new life and life eternal. Right? This was his true self, but it had to happen through the cross. He came as a suffering servant, not a conquering ruler. But man, the temptation to be the false self is huge. And we have this temptation to put on, these, to the, put on the false self. And our invitation is to deny that temptation as well and embrace the true self. Now, what did I say, though? I said the true self, not the perfect self. And see, I think this is where we can get really hung up. Because the true self just it, it acknowledges, we acknowledge and own the fullness of who we are, of what we're feeling, what we're experiencing not the person or the experience or the feelings that we want them to be, right? It would be kind of like posting on Instagram or Facebook the drool stain that's down, like on, crusted on your cheek right after that nap, rather than, you know, the, the primped and the makeup and the, you know, slightly turned angle for the artistic effect. <laughs> right? It would be that full honesty, acknowledging that, you know what, I'm kind of, I, I am afraid, I'm a mess, I'm vulnerable. Now, I'm not telling you to go do that on Instagram and Facebook. Don't go, you don't need to go dump all your stuff on the internet. Because <laughs> right? actually, that's not usually out of an attempt to embrace a, fall, a true self either. Those who dump all their stuff on the internet are also usually embracing a false self that looks something like, hey, I'm constantly a victim, have pity on me. What makes me valuable is when people notice me, even when I'm a mess. And so it's not about just dumping all of our stuff out there, but it is about starting to acknowledge that there's stuff underneath that doesn't always match the stuff that's right here. And it's getting in touch with that. Because when we make this thing, the mask, the focus, that becomes a character that we have to play. And unless you're a phenomenally good actor, it's very difficult to have a full range of human emotion and experience when you're focused on this one mask, this one way of being, this one sense of identity. If that's your focus, then the reality is 
We have to push away all of the other things that seem contrary to that, which by definition means we're no longer embracing our true self, the fullness of, of who we are, where we are right now. But it's challenging. And it's scary. And it was actually hard for Jesus. I think we just go, oh man, he's Jesus, it was no big deal. But if this is actually temptation, which it's clearly temptation, that's what it says over and over again, then the temptation had to be real, which means Jesus was really experiencing inner turmoil in the midst of this temptation. It was real. And it's real for us. But I think it was so important, the order of operations here, before Jesus was tempted, in all of these ways to embrace a false self and to put on these masks, what happened? What did we talk about at the very beginning? He was baptized, and as he came out of the water and was praying, what did he hear? Yes, you are my son whom I love. I'm pleased with you. See, from that place, we can start to actually embrace our true self. Because that's who you are. Because that's what Jesus went to accomplish. Because he didn't give in to the temptation and instead embraced the true self, which was the suffering servant on a cross for you and for me, that means that we can know for sure that we are the beloved of God. That he took on our sin, our false self, our rebellion, our self-justifications, our denials. He took them all upon himself. And in its place, what do we have? Radical acceptance and love from the creator of the universe. From the heavenly father. And when we have that as our core of our identity, we can be honest about the rest. Because our belovedness is not based on the false self, outward projection stuff, possessions and power and performance. It's not based on any of those things. It was based on Jesus' true self. And the only way I can move out of my stuckness is to fully embrace and acknowledge the full gamut of it. I am ragingly loved and I am horribly afraid. And I am a failure, and I am unworthy, and I am feeling threatened. Only in that full honesty. There's a story I read um, from Leadership Magazine that it was about two brothers, and they were incredibly wealthy. But they used their wealth as a way to mask what was really going on within them. They were wicked, they were cruel, they were deceitful, they were hard-nosed in their business, but they were a part of a church. And they were able to cover over a lot of their true self with this false self of radical generosity. And so they threw their money around. And the time came and there was need for a, a new sanctuary for the church and in the midst of that major campaign, one of the brothers died. And the other remaining brother meets with the pastor and he was getting ready for the service, and the day before the, the memorial service, gives the pastor an envelope full of money and whispers in his ear and says, hey, the money that you need is for the new sanctuary, it's all here. I just want to give, give it to you on one condition. Tomorrow, just tell everybody he was a saint. And so the next day, the service comes. The pastor had already deposited the money. He stands up before the congregation and says, he was wicked, he was cruel, he was greedy, he was deceitful, and compared to his brother, he was a saint. <laughs> I tell you that because he was both through Jesus Christ, and so are you that you might embrace that false self and you might put on that mask and take off that mask and you might keep putting it on and you might keep taking it off and putting it on, taking it off, because you're a work in progress. And part of that mask might be really ugly at times or what's underneath that mask might be really ugly at times. And you might be ashamed of it. 
And you might be trying so hard to hide it, it's why the mask keeps getting back on. But the path forward to become unstuck is to stop hiding it. It's to bring it out into the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. All of the fear and the worry and the anxiety and the, perhaps even the hatred and the ugliness and the shame and the judgmentalism and the self-righteousness and ah, I'm not any of those things. And maybe I am most all of those things, depending on the moment. And the only way to no longer be those and to be fully and completely or at least more fully living out of the true identity of the beloved son of God is to bring it out in the open. Because that's the true self. And as we do, the beauty is the true self begins to look more and more like Jesus. Because at the end of the days, that's what our lives are going to look like. I know you're not there yet, because neither am I. But it doesn't matter how ugly it is today. <laughs> you're a work in progress by a master artist who wants to get you unstuck as you take off the mask and you let him in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the pressure to, to put on a performance, to polish ourselves up and make ourselves look a certain way to the world and to ourselves is so high. It's huge. We just acknowledge that to you. And so we fit into roles and we put on performances and we embrace identities that were not intended for us so that we can cover over the stuff that's underneath. We can become numb to the things that we're afraid of. Lord God, give us that courage to take off the masks, to acknowledge before you and perhaps even before one other person a small group of people what's really going on who we truly are today with a beautiful and wonderful hope that we will not always be this way but that we will someday be made like Jesus but every day from here to there Lord help us remember the truth that we are the beloved daughters and sons of the Father in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.